the one lesson that matters, it's all about relationships. Mm-hmm. Like really at the end of the day, like I don't meet you without a relationship. We're not doing this without a relationship with someone that I went out of my way to build a relationship with because I thought he was a good dude, right? So I've got this concept on my show that I've, I've come up with and it's, it's probably the core tenet of the show now after two and a half years, which I call Pipeline for Life. So mm. the, the lesson there is let's stop thinking about the month, the quarter, like if you think about every conversation you have with someone that you're building a pipeline for life versus building a pipeline for your next paycheck, Mm -hmm. it's going to fundamentally change how you approach that conversation. Yeah. What's up everybody. Your life alchemist, your dragon. Welcome to alchemized life. I'm your host, Justin David Carl. This is a show where I seek out and share expertise, wisdom, and thought leadership in all domains with the mission of empowering and inspiring you to proactively design and truly live a life worth living. We're all in this together. And when we do the work together, we go so much farther, so much faster, and have so much more fun. Without further ado, Let's dig into this episode and alchemize life. Josh Wagner, so excited to have you on the show. Finally, you know, quick note for the audience. Before I launched my podcast, I connected with Josh because he's the host of Love Selling Hate Sales, and he's way ahead of me in terms of the podcasting game, has tons of episodes with a ton of awesome people, and you know, I didn't know what I was doing, and he was happy to get on the phone with me and give me some mentoring and some coaching around you know, how to actually launch a podcast and get around to that. So first and foremost, Josh, deep thank you to the positive impact that you've had on me and my journey to podcasting and other endeavors in life. And just to well, give you're most uh, welcome. Yeah. So uh, you're in addition to being the host of that incredible show. So if you are interested in sales or in sales, uh, definitely check out his podcast. Um, but in addition to that, you're a sales executive, a career entrepreneur, and much, much more. So <laughs> to kind of like kick things off. I'd love to know how you got to where you're at. You know, how did you come up in the world of sales? How did you actually like finally start a podcast? And and let's start there. So passing it over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And you were a great guest on my show as well. So let's not short change that as well. But yeah, so my journey is somewhat interesting. I went to broadcast school when I was in college and I'm the son of an entrepreneur, but my, my dad's a carpenter, right? So when I was a, a kid, Uh, By the time I was 14 years old, I was swinging a hammer at 5 a.m. in Arizona in the heat. So there was no hiding from hard work when when I was a young person. But I also think I, being around the 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 framers and that culture, you get a little bit inundated into like the cowboy culture, right? Like you're an entrepreneur, you're a little bit of a roughneck, like all these kind of different things. And as I've gotten older, I've seen how that seeped into my personality, into my life, and and how I do things. But when I was in broadcast school and I was about to graduate, you know, I, I did an internship at a radio station as, as a sales intern. And basically the the GM of the station, when I walked in the door, I, I got a referral from my one of my professors. And he said, hey, Josh, glad you're here. Gave me a pat on the back, handed me a phone book, said, here's your chair, there's the phone. Good luck, kid. And that was my sales internship at this radio station. So <laughs> I'm like, all right. Now I got to figure out what I'm going to do. So instead of just cracking open the phone book and and starting to make some calls, I wandered around the studio and and talked to some people. I was like, Hey, who, who advertises on this station? I mean, do we have an ICP? And I didn't say that because that wasn't really a thing then, but you know, who who do we sell to? And I found out just to clarify for the audience, ICP is ideal customer profile. Yes. Thank you. For those who aren't aware, we're going to have to make sure we break down all the language for the non-sales people. There's going to be a glossary in the show notes with all of the sales and marketing uh, acronyms that are out there. So look forward to that. 
But yeah, so, you know, I found out that this radio station sold to little boutique shops and golf courses. And if you are familiar with the Phoenix area at all, you'll know that there are lots of boutique shops and golf courses. So Mm -hmm. not a bad thing, right? So I basically, you know, break down, I start calling on different lists. I I create two different, one PowerPoint presentation with two versions, right? One to pitch golf courses, one to pitch boutique shops. I spent three days a week calling and two days a week driving to do those pitches, right? That was my goal. Like, I don't want to be sitting in this little studio every day. I'll call, I'll book appointments and I'll get on the road and I'll pitch. Great. That actually worked out pretty well. I actually sold more than anybody in the station they offered me a job. I said, no, I would never work at this shithole for any longer than this. <laughs> and uh, they're like, oh, okay, sounds good. And then I come up to graduation and I'm just like, oh man, I don't think I want to work for anybody. Uh, let me let me start a company. Mm-hmm. So I call one of my buddies and I say, hey man, you know, he had, he had kind of gotten plucked out of college and had been doing event production for uh, a couple of years already. I said, hey dude, what are you doing? Ah, uh, you know, just kind of doing the show, whatever. And so let's start a company. He's like, all right, okay, what are we going to do? I said, well, we're going to do what you do. And he's like, well, you don't know anything about it. I'm like, yeah, sure, but I'll sell it. <laughs> you do it. He's like, you're an idiot. And, you know, hangs up on me. And then two weeks later, I get a call from him. He's like, you know what? I don't think that's a bad idea. We can probably <laughs> do this. Let's start a company. So he comes back. I don't even remember where he was, maybe Hawaii or Colorado or something like that. And we, you know, map out a little business plan. And, you know, when you start a company at 22 with no experience, no money and no contacts, it's not exactly the uh, epitome of a successful business formula. Yeah. But we did our thing. We we went about four years together. We found a little niche for ourselves, creating, uh, doing live events, which he had a background in, but we got partnered up with uh, companies that did automotive training events for like the big car manufacturers, you know, the Mm. Hondas, Toyotas of the world. So we wound up doing that. We did everything, logistics, AV, event, you know, some of the production type of stuff, but we were on the road, you know, nine to 10 months out of the year. We realized by year two that we hadn't really created a business. We had just created, you know, nice little jobs for ourselves. If we weren't out in the field grinding, we weren't making money. So we got to this inflection point in 2006. Coincidentally, both of us got married that year and we looked at each other and we're like, do we want to just keep doing this and never see our significant other? Or do we want to just go on and try something else? Cause this isn't really a business. And mm-hmm. we'd mutually decided it's time to cut ties. Let's go do something. He wound up working for, if you've ever read the book, rich dad, poor dad, Yep. my uh, buddy went and worked for Robert Kiyosaki. He's located here oh, in Scottsdale. That's and, uh, fascinating. Did, yeah. Right. Manage uh, production, video production and everything for Robert for a number of years. That was kind of fun. Um, I wound up working for an e-learning company and ran sales and marketing for them. But, you know, that basically meant I was a team of one running sales and marketing. It wasn't like I was, you know, managing some huge team or anything. Um, And that company was super interesting because they were at an inflection point in their business where they were a traditional production company, which is how we got connected. And they got crushed by 9-11. And, you know, they had big airline clients and things like that. They weren't making money for six, eight, 12 months. So they were trying to pivot their business to something that was more future looking. And they decided that they could use the resources that they had and create an e-learning company. Now, even at that time, corporate e-learning was pretty crowded. It's not like you were going to come in and go compete with Saba or any of the big, you know, university e-learning systems, corporate e-learning systems. So the plan that we put together was to one decide of the business that we had could we convert it from traditional production to e-learning that was my first job and my second job was to figure out okay what industries could we go into that are heavy in compliance but low in sophistication right and we could brand little niche businesses for each one of those we partner with the subject matter expert we get the content from them We'd hang it on our platform and we'd go into these verticalized industries and, you know, just go and take over that way. And that was kind of cool because I basically got to start four little mini companies at one time, right? And created this shared service model that was, you know, cool, you know, for the e-learning company, it was pretty neat. But then um, I was able to understand how to partner with people, subject matter experts, get content together. Then I had to go out, learn these industries. I'd go pitch into these industries. I'd go to their industry conferences. I, you know, all that kind of thing. So it was kind of a fun 
a fun deal a lot about being an entrepreneur. So even though I was technically in charge of driving revenue for the company, my boss at the time, who was the CEO, he really did a good job of teaching me the value of, you know, consultative selling, right? We built business cases together. We looked at, it was way beyond the transaction. And I think that was kind of my first foray into maybe more of a structured sales type environment. But even then, you know, we were, we were very much on the consultative side and really, you know, understanding key stakeholders, business cases and all that kind of stuff. So that was really fun. So in a period of time there around, um, let's say 20, 2009, 2010, I got a LinkedIn message from a guy named Justin Gray, who is the CEO founder of lead MD. And we'll, we'll get to that in a, in a minute, but He basically said, hey, man, we grew up together in Fountain Hills. His dad was also in construction. My dad was in construction. We'd known each other for for a number of years. You know, we'd run into each other uh, in college and whatnot every now and then. But so he's like, hey, let's grab lunch. We'll catch up. So we grab lunch. He was at the time starting LeadMD, which was this um, small boutique consulting firm, but also had a payment processing company. And his payment processing company was looking for some sort of value add differentiator. Long story short, I wound up selling him some e-learning as this value add program that they built for their payment processing company. At the same time, after we meet, you know, I'm going on LinkedIn, I'm going on his website, kind of looking what he's up to. And he's feeding me these little emails of like, hey, Josh Wagner visited your website. And he's showing me these scores thing, like sc- numbers and scores going next to my name. This was early, early, early days of marketing automation, right? Justin was actually Marketo's 19th customer. So Marketo's mm. a marketing automation platform for those of you that aren't aware. And he was building this services business, servicing Marketo. Mm. So we wind up talking more about this stuff and he sells me Marketo for the e-learning company. Uh, we, we implemented Salesforce, Marketo. He helped me implement it. And during the next couple of years, I used Marketo as the marketing automation platform to fuel all five of those businesses, the core mm-hmm. shared service business and the four vertical market businesses that we built. I ran them all out of the one platform and I created all these automations and flows for how we would run, you know, some basic nurture marketing for all these businesses. Um, you know, we do trade shows, do all this kind of stuff. And Marketo was running it out of the back end. So I, by default, became a Marketo power user. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, things are fast forward a little bit and around uh, 2013, I started to get an itch. I'd been there seven years to do something else. One of my buddies said, Hey, you should get into some sort of medical or pharmaceutical sales. I'm like, okay, sure. So (laughs) I do that. I, I the know. reason behind that is because there's a lot of money in it. He he why, basically why? said he basically said it's an easy way to make money. You'll do fine. They love B two B people. I'm like yeah, I have no experience in this. And he's like, well, my wife does. She'll help you. So actually, his wife was great. Um, she helped me put together this like little portfolio, and we took it out. And people were like, oh wow, it seems like you've been in this forever. But you know, she just kind of wrote a playbook for me. I used the playbook, and then you know, used my charming self in the interview to. To, to wow them from that point forward. So I got this job selling drugs for this uh, gastrointestinal pharmaceutical <laughs> company, super not sexy, talking about anal fissures and stuff like that. Good times. Yeah, really good time. The The funny thing was I was what there for like- What age were you when you started that? 33 or 34. Okay. Yeah. So this stuff is like, not rocket science. I mean, it's it's not selling at all. I mean, you're basically a walking, talking billboard because the FDA paints the white lines where you can only say so much, right? Without getting into mm-hmm. trouble. Yeah. You don't get people to sign anything. There's this whole convoluted chain of, okay, you talk to a doctor, you tell them about your drug. Maybe they see a patient who has a need for that drug and maybe they remember that drug. So they prescribe it. They give it to the patient. The patient maybe goes to the pharmacy with the prescription. The pharmacist hopefully fills the prescription with that and not a generic version. Mm. And then if all of those things happen and it gets recorded, you get credit for it and you might get paid something in some amount of time. That sounds like like 
like, this did you ridiculous. actually make any money in it? I or? did. I was actually good at it. I, I, I was, I think, the top, the top performer on my team and got some stupid bonus. But the funny thing was, is um, the company got sold to a bigger pharma company. Mm. And I was brand new. I was like four months in. So I knew I was out. They weren't going to keep me. Yeah. So it was, I'm sitting, I, I'll never forget. I'm sitting in the parking lot of a doctor's office in Vegas because I had Phoenix in Vegas, oddly enough. Mm-hmm. And I get this text from Justin. He's like, hey, my services company is growing. I need someone who understands this shit to work for me and sell it. You interested? I'm like, yeah, of course I'm interested. I'm, I'm about to lose my job. That's kind of stupid anyway, but you know, sure, let's do it. So I get back to Phoenix, set up an interview. You know, Justin's obviously bought in his head of services at the time, who was the head of services for quite a long time, and a woman named Andrea Lechner Becker. She hated me. She was like, this guy's full of shit. He just thinks he could talk his way out of anything. <laughs> Don't hire him. And Justin was like, I'm going to hire him. Andrea and I, did great. We worked together for like eight years and you know, we got along really well, but that was, I always give her shit about that. I'm like, if it wasn't for you, if it wasn't for Justin, I wouldn't be here. You would have canned me. <laughs> so I wind up working for this little startup called lead MD that basically sold one thing in three different ways. We sold Marketo implementations, Marketo optimization and Marketo staff augmentation. That was it. And How interesting. Yeah, that's what I did for the first like five years before we started to grow and, and bolt on other services that surrounded Marketo. Mm-hmm. But that was kind of the start of my career in B2B SaaS. You know, I, yeah. I went to all the Marketo events. I That's how I met Brandon. So your friend Brandon Delgadio yeah. introduced us, right? Yep. So this, this is actually an interesting story because you know Brandon. So early on, I would go to these Marketo events and I could tell that this guy was different. I was like, Mm -hmm. this guy doesn't operate like all these other SaaS sellers. Like he's actually unique. He's smart. Like I can tell he's super intentional. So I made it my mission to work with Brandon and -hmm. he was having none of it. He's just like, oh, hey, nice to meet you. You know, I'm on my way. Like, you know, I mean, he's just like, who is this fucking guy? Like, I I don't need another partner guy thinking he's going to sell me stuff, whatever. So I just kept working on Brandon, working on Brandon, working on Brandon. And then finally we did a deal together and he gave me a shot. And we won and then we did another one and we won and then we did a bunch more and we kept winning. And then Brandon and I just became like, he was my, I was his service partner. He was my software. Like we just did a bunch of deals together until, you know, that time came to an end. But, um, that's how I met Brandon and consequently how I met you through, through that network. So that's kind of interesting. Hey there, just a few words about the incredible show sponsors for today's episode, and then we'll dig right back in. Today's show is brought to you by Veg Nutrition, Live Better. So I'm actually a veg elite athlete, and before I joined the team, I spent months doing my due diligence to make sure that the company was vision, mission, and value aligned with me, my values, my mission, my vision, and my lifestyle. I got to know the owners super well. I even got to know the person who formulates all the products, and they passed with flying colors. So I couldn't be more excited to represent a company that I feel so aligned with. And I want to tell you about two of my favorite products. The first is the Veg Pre-Workout. So when I first went vegan or mostly vegan, the last thing for me to go fully vegan was finding a vegan pre-workout that gave me the focus, the energy, and the power that I was looking for. And I can tell you, this is the best pre-workout that I've ever had. It gives me incredible focus and energy. And what's probably the best is it leaves me with no crash after I take it, which is great. And the flavors are so freaking good. There's literally peach mango and a Patriot pop that tastes like, you know, the firecracker popsicles, cherry lemon lime flavor. They're literally so good that I can dry scoop them. And they just released a watermelon flavor for just in time for summer. And it's incredible. So that's the first product. 
The second product is arguably also my favorite, and that's the plant protein. Comes in three incredible flavors, chocolate peanut butter, vanilla ice cream, and cold brew coffee. Yep, you heard me. Cold brew coffee flavor. It tastes incredible, all three flavors. 25 grams of protein, fully organic, incredible ingredients, heavy metal tested, and it is my go-to post-workout. Make sure that I'm recovering and refueling and giving my muscles the protein that they need to rebuild for that next workout. So go to vegnutrition.com slash dragon and try their full line of supplements and you'll get 15% off. Or you can just use dragon at checkout and you'll get 15% off. So that's vegnutrition.com slash dragon to get 15% off. Veg Nutrition, live better. Yeah. So just to kind of like uh, fill in the picture for the audience a little bit. So Brandon has actually been my sales mentor for the last like eight or nine years. So a little bit of my own sales journey. When I first uh, joined Garten, the Stanford startup I'm a a part of, uh, I was like, I've never done B2B sales. I've done sales like pretty much all my life, but like, I don't know what I'm doing. I need to get a mentor. And one of my fraternity sisters, because I was in a co-ed business fraternity at Stanford, we had like reconnected and she mentioned over lunch one time, she's like, uh, you know, I told her about this new gig I was doing and she was like, oh, you should talk to my husband. He's He's been in like B2B like SaaS sales and for the audience, uh, SaaS software as a service. And, you know, he, he I'm sure he'd be open to talking to you. And then, you know, we... Uh, Ended up talking and like, honestly, him and one other person have been my sales mentors for the last nine, almost nine years now. And they have been like absolutely fundamental to my own like growth and success as a salesperson. So we're showing him a lot of love. <laughs> He's a great person in many different ways. Obviously, the two of you made a lot of money together. But yeah, I wanted to touch back on that. It sound like it sound like you had a few kind of mentors th- uh, throughout your journey. Was that the case? Like, were you consciously seeking them out, or just kind of like naturally find them? Or how did mentors play a role in your your kind of journey? Yeah, it was pretty organic because when so the two main jobs we'll talk resolutions, the learning company, and at LeadMD. You know, I reported to the CEO in both business and. Those mm-hmm. two became de facto mentors and they were good in very different ways. So Steve was a lot further along in his career. He had done a lot of, you know, big enterprise sales types of jobs in the seventies and eighties. Right. So, mm-hmm. you know, he definitely wasn't a modern salesperson, but <laughs> certainly had a lot of the wisdom, a lot of the business thinking, you know, he was running this company. He, he bootstrapped it, built it from scratch. Like, So I got to really learn the business side of sales. And I think it's one of the most foundational things that you can do to try to excel and and move up the chain in sales is is gain some business acumen, understand how businesses work. How do they make money? What does cash flow do? How do you read a P&L? How do you read a balance sheet? Like, because those are the conversations that C-level executives are having and everyone's saying, oh, you need to go sell into the C-suite. Most people don't even know what the hell that means, right? Like if you don't know how to talk to, a business owner and you know i was one right like regardless my company wasn't a a company with a lot of employees but trust me i had to care about cash flow i had to care about my p l i had to pay taxes like all these different things that people don't think about regardless if you're a two-person company or a two thousand person company you still think about the same things right yeah so that gave me an edge just having that context from steve early on just like how does the business work that I yeah. could feel confident talking to anybody about anything because I could always bring it back to the business, right? And quickly learning how different businesses and different industries make money. Yeah. If you could speak it in their language, it gives you it gives you an edge. So Steve was definitely a mentor from that end. Now, mm-hmm. Justin, which is kind of funny, like I told you Justin sold us Marketo and and, and marketing services when I was there. Justin and Steve butted heads um cuz they mm. you know they're very different. Justin's a hard charger, right? And 
I'm not a super intense person. I'm self-motivated. Um, I, I want to be successful, but I don't have the same level of intensity that Justin naturally has. And he threw me into that B2B SaaS world that we were talking about that can be, you know, kind of cutthroat, hard charging. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of activity, you know, sales leadership's doing these things and him just throwing me into the deep end of the pool for that. And then helping me navigate was, was really, really good. And when I was able to combine Steve's style and Justin's style to create my style, I actually think that that was a pretty powerful thing for me. That's awesome. Yeah. I feel like, uh, that's definitely been something that I've now recognized in my own life is, is kind of like your mentors influence your selling style. And then you kind of throw your own, like, st like your own twist on it and it right. kind of becomes your own. So, uh, absolutely love that. A couple things I want to talk about real quick. So Salesforce is a CRM, which is a customer relations, uh, management, uh, system just because yeah. like my podcast is not a sales podcast, but I'm so yeah. excited to do this, uh, <laughs> with you because everyone is selling, whether Something. they're selling, uh, like an activity or an idea to their wife or their child <laughs> or their friend, or, you know, they're trying to get a new job, you know, and they're selling to that person. So I think sales is like one of those just like fundamental skills that people should have. And then like B2B SaaS sales is kind of like, you know, the upper echelon of like just how far you can go with sales and how like, you know, strategic and challenging and, you know, how much opportunity and wealth, uh, you know, can be made, um, in sales. So can you break down consultative selling for me? Yeah. So, you know, consultative selling, the, the whole idea is that you're a consultant first, a salesperson later. And this is not mm -hmm. like from this consult sales saving manual, but I'm trying to distill it down to some sim simple concepts. So the idea is that you're doing really meaningful discovery on the front end and that mm -hmm. discovery discovery is one of those skills that's kind of gotten bastardized over the last 10 so years with the b2b SaaS world right they've turned discovery into almost a survey where it's just like checking boxes hey do you do this do you do this do you do this so they can mm -hmm. pretend to tailor their demo but real consultative discovery is almost think of yourself as a consultant doing a business diagnostic right and you're getting up under the hood to understand, okay, this is what you sell. These are your markets. This is where you generate your revenue. You have this type of, you know, capital cash that comes in through these types of sales. You've got cash flow that comes in through a recurring model over here. Uh, okay, your PL looks like this because you spend X amount, your cost of goods sold. Like, right, you start to understand how the business works, right? Yeah. And then you start to look for areas in the business that you can either help accelerate you know, grow faster, add, you know, improve or cut costs. Like that's most, if you're selling something, you're either trying to help them grow or help them cut costs. Like that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. um, so in the consultative model, you're essentially helping to understand, look at the business, run your diagnostic, and then see if your solution can solve one of those two problems within the diagnostic, right? And you wrap some sort of business case around it because hopefully in the discovery, you can map out, their business in a very simple way, yeah. you know, visually if possible. And, you know, maybe a funnel analogy, right? Okay. You, you generate pipeline this way, you convert this, you know, you convert through, you build this little funnel, you show them their conversions and you, you say, there's this inflection point where I think there's a huge opportunity for you. You're converting way less than an industry average here. If we apply this, which hopefully is your solution, we can increase that by, and then, you know, if you do the math, that means a hundred million dollars in revenue over the next five years, you know, just yeah. as, as an example, like that's the core tendency of consultative selling. In in my opinion, it starts with really good business diagnostic level discovery so that you're getting to an output that's business focused and not product focused. Yeah. So it's almost like if you have like, um, like a deep understanding of business strategy, you're able to like do consultative selling like really well. But if you don't have that, like you're gonna like you're not gonna be very good. Um, or you're not gonna be very valuable to a potential client um because you're not even gonna be able to, you know, really help them achieve their actual goals. Yeah, and this so. is where sales enablement and sales training is falling down and doing a disservice for the sales community because they bring these people in. 
They give them product coaching, feature benefit coaching. Like they, they do all this stuff that's very me centric. Mm-hmm. Like, look at me. Look how great we are. Look what you could do. But they're yeah, not look how teaching. Great our product is like right. But they're not teaching these people how to understand the business. Talk to these people about their business and look for things that could actually help their business grow. Yeah. So now you get, you know, a thousand emails a day. You're a CEO. You get a thousand emails a day of someone trying to knock on your door and pitch you something. And they're all doing the same thing. Look at me. Look at me. None, none of it is about them and what they're trying to solve. And I think that's where in the industry, your sales enablement and sales training needs to get better. Yeah. Yeah, this brings me back to a conversation that we had just about, you know, as I've been looking to grow my podcast and, you know, share like you like I I had you like read one of my posts and, you know, you're like, it's good, but it's very like self-serving and self-centered and like you should really like reframe or in the next post, like what value are you bringing to, right. you know, the people that are reading your post. And I think that's like a perfect way to think about, you know, uh, when you're trying to sell to somebody, like what value are you actually bringing to them? Not like how cool you are, how cool your product is, but like, what is the value that you can potentially deliver to them or even give them without selling them anything? And then once they get that value up front, they're like, oh, there's going to be way more value. I'm interested. Uh, because they've already improved, you know, my, you know, business strategy or my thinking or, you know, uh, gave me some great ideas or some great insights. So that's, that's awesome. Let's segue into, you know, the rest of your career up until you actually start your own podcast. So how do you get to that part? Yeah. So my, my podcast started in spring of 2020. So most of you would know that's the, the start of COVID. Yeah. And I was actually a little nervous, right? Like I didn't know what was going to happen. You know, hindsight is 2020, but I was really fearful that the business was going to just tank because I I didn't know what was going to happen. And it actually wound up being one of the best years of my career. So I, I, I don't know if I just didn't have anything to worry about or if because I overcompensated, I just had a great year. Who knows? But one of the things I really wanted to do was I've always, so a couple of things. One, I, I told you earlier, I went to broadcast school, right? So I, w- I always thought I was going to be some level of broadcaster. I never was, but this gets me a chance to play around and pretend like I'm a broadcaster. So I get to act like I'm a little kid. That's, that's fun. That's one. Of the <laughs> you do I have saying. a really great broadcasting voice. I have to say. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. So that was, that's one part of it. And then the other part of it is I always wanted to, I was like, how can I elevate the profession of sales? Like there's, I've I've been selling to and through software companies and there's not that many Brandon Delgadios out there, right? Like so many of these software reps just, and it's not always their fault. It's just, they get caught into what they think sales is and what it should be. And they're not themselves. And so I was like, how can I take all this that I've learned and just get it out there in a way that's fun. And just frankly, I wanted to grow a little bit. So I'd been, you know, with my company for eight years now, it was six years at the time. And I was looking for, you talk about mentors, some outside influence, right? This gave me a easy way to just flatter people and say, Hey, I'd really like to have you on my show. And I get a free MBA on sales every week from some really freaking smart people. And now my style is evolving because I'm taking in all this info from all these other folks. So I just started reaching out to folks who I knew and said, Hey, will you do this? Will you come on? Will you do this? And you know, it morphed and grew over time. I think I've gotten a little bit better at it over time, but it's really fun and it's really educational. Like it's selfishly, it's one of the craziest learning experiences of my life. Yeah. You know, I'm only, uh, as of today's day, only 13 episodes out. Uh, but yeah. like it is literally the most amazing like excuse to basically talk to anybody, not potentially anybody about, you know, anything that you're interested in learning from them. Like you can ask them all the questions that like maybe you wouldn't like normally ask them in a normal conversation and they would actually potentially give you the time of the day. You know, a lot of people like 
you know, everyone's busy. But if you uh, have a podcast, I mean, a lot of people are oftentimes interested in coming on a podcast because, uh, you know, I mean, this in the most loving, nice way. Who doesn't like to talk about themselves and have a lot of people hear that? <laughs> it's a crazy good door opener. That's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So how did you come up with the the, the name of the podcast? Uh, I, I feel like it's a very unique podcast name. Yeah. So I wrote this article on LinkedIn one day and, you know, I was trying to always come up with ways to, 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 to write and create and try to build content for myself. And I had probably, I think I had just gotten that out of a particularly frustrating sales pipeline meeting. And if you know me, I really love the relationship, the consultation, the building, the business case, the value engineering, like that side of sales. I love mm -hmm. the metrics, the data, the dashboards, the inputs, the outputs. Like I don't give a shit about any of that. Like it's just, it's just not my jam. Like I told you early on, I'm a little bit of a cowboy. So like the data <laughs> side of sales isn't my favorite thing. So I wrote this article and I said, I often tell people I love selling, but I hate sales. And mm -hmm. I wrote this whole article about that. And this article did really well. Like people were commenting, oh my God, I've always felt that way. Or you're an idiot. Like without the metrics, none of this matters. You know, so all this kind of stuff, like this is so great. Yeah. And I just basically said, this is going to be my podcast. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to title it this. And I'm going to talk to people about what they love about sales, what they hate about sales, the art, the science, and, you know, it evolved into basically talking about whatever the hell I wanted to. It's my show, but that was the impetus for getting it started. That's awesome. So you've been doing it for a little, like we're approaching three years. Um, yeah, we're getting close. Um, 94 episodes. Uh, 94 just went out this past week. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that I started experimenting with is solo episodes. So oh, not great. having a guest. And I keep those under 10 minutes. They're usually something that's just uh, like a quick hit, tip, something on my mind, whatever it may be. So this last one I did is called six degrees of kevin bacon mm -hmm. so for those of you that remember the game six degrees of kevin bacon basically you are naming an actor or actress and saying can you get them connected to kevin bacon by six people right like boom mm -hmm. boom 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 so i said how can you use six degrees of kevin bacon to build your pipeline so another thing to know about me when it comes to sales like i'm not a cold caller i'm not like i'm that i'm not an expert in that not really my jam i'm a relationship person and a referral based person um so I said, you can use the concept of six degrees of Kevin Bacon to build your pipeline. And I gave three examples using like LinkedIn and executives and things like that. So that was a, you know, a quick hit solo episode. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I love that. That's super creative. So in terms of your podcast, you have 94 episodes out and you've talked to, you know, a lot of sales and marketing people mm -hmm. and you know, garnered a ton of wisdom just around all things sales and wisdom uh, or sales and marketing uh, wisdom. What kind of like, if I were to ask you kind of like the top, you know, five to 10 lessons, you know, or we depending on how long each lesson is, like even the top like three that you would share with someone who's looking to improve their sales game? <laughs> the one lesson that matters, it's all about relationships. Mm -hmm. Like really at the end of the day, like I don't meet you without a relationship. We're not doing this without a relationship with someone that I went out of my way to build a relationship with. Cause I thought he was a good dude. Right. So I've got this concept on my show that I've, I've come up with and it's, it's probably the core tenet of the show now after two and a half years, which I call pipeline for life. So mm. the, the lesson there is let's stop thinking about the month, the quarter, like if you think about every conversation you have with someone that you're building a pipeline for life versus building a pipeline for your next paycheck, mm -hmm. it's going to fundamentally change how you approach that conversation. Yeah, You're going to treat that person with humanity because you're going to want to be able to call them again and talk to them. You're going to want to learn about them. You're going to figure out who they are, how they work, what's important to them, what's not important to them. And most importantly, if they're not a good fit for you, you're going to be able to say, you know what? You're not, I, I don't think I can help you. But you know what? My buddy can. They have this yeah. company that does X, Y, and Z. Would you like to meet them? Yeah. Now you've just like created three new relationships out of that one conversation. Yep. That is the core tenant of building a pipeline for life. And I can tell you that I can only think of a, of a handful of people that would never take my call. Just probably because, <laughs> you know, I fucked up, which is fine. We yep. all do that sometimes. We don't, we don't always run it perfectly despite our best intentions. Yeah. And... 
almost every conversation that I've ever had has come back around in some way, whether it's a, a deal, a referral, a question, a podcast guest, a this or that. Yep. So the, the biggest thing I learned, even getting guests on the show was relationships. Yep. Someone on, Hey, you should really talk to this person. Okay, cool. Reach out to them. They make an email connection or LinkedIn connection. You have them on like, Oh man, you're super cool. You know what? You should talk to this person. Like just those types of things. And if you t- think of the mantra of building a pipeline for life, that's what came out of. You Can know, you, first- uh, like I'm super familiar with pipeline, but I know some of my l- listeners, like I know when I first got into sales, I was like, I don't even know what a pipeline is. Like, can you okay. break that down real quick? Yeah, for sure. So in sales, they call the pipeline, the lifeblood, because that's basically the opportunities that you're working to try to close business, right? So um, if you think of it in a very linear way, right, you make, say you make a hundred calls a day, you're making those hundred calls to build your pipeline and get people into your funnel so mm-hmm. that you are building sales opportunities, right? So you make a hundred calls, maybe you connect with 10 people. Of those 10 people, maybe three of them are interested in hearing about what you have to say. So you talk to those three people and one of them is like actually interested in a really good fit for your product. So like that process of talking to people and finding opportunities is the process of building pipeline, right? Yeah. I do it less linearly. I don't make a hundred calls a day. I try to talk to you know, five or 10 really cool people every day that, you know, just have a conversation and see what happens and this and that. I I like the idea of building one to many relationships. So software Mm -hmm. partnerships, venture capital partnerships, uh, you know, things like that. People who have access to lots of customers that might say, oh, you know, you should talk to Josh. He's got something going on that could help you with X. So the idea of pipeline is just like the, the, the opportunities that you're finding that you might be able to sell. Yeah. There's kind of three things I want to call out for the audience that really stand out for me that like top, top, top salespeople do. And, you know, first and foremost, pipeline for life. That's exactly how I've built my sales career is like, it's the long game. It's like, I've had so many like clients uh, or potential customers that like the first go around, it didn't like, it wasn't a fit. But then like one or two years later, they reach back out and like, hey, I'm at a new company and like your product would be perfect for uh, like me and our in my new like company. And it's like it, it's just like you're planting the seeds, you're planting the trees and, and then they grow. And uh, it's also just so much more satisfying, like when you treat humans like humans instead of like a transaction that you're trying to close. And instead, like you said, get to know them, like what is important to them, like, you know, what's going on in their life outside of business and, you know, what are their business goals? So it's kind of like having a whole picture and a whole understanding of someone like, you know, all your great friends, like, you know, about the work, but you also know about their, you know, their, their relationship with their significant other, their kids, their interests, et cetera. And then you're actually excited to talk to that person. Because you, it's like fun to hear about other people's life, right? And then they want to know about your life and it actually becomes a real relationship and it makes work like infinitely more fulfilling because it's filled with great relationships. So that's the first thing. The second thing, and you kind of just glided right over it, is building content as a salesperson. And this is one of the things that I like try to, you know, teach to other salespeople that are looking to learn from me is like... It doesn't like there's multiple ways to do it, but like the more content that you build, either related to the what you're selling or just related to you. So it actually gives people a deeper understanding of who you are, what you're about, what's important to you. It basically legitimizes like you as a human. So like I'm like not super active on LinkedIn. Uh, I, I go through phases, but I am super active on like my blog and Instagram. And like I know for sure, many times clients have like looked me up on Instagram and they're like, oh, he totally does live this whole like holistic well being life. And like he is representing like a well being company. Like he's not just trying to sell me something. That's huge. like this is literally who he is. It's a proof. And point. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. And like you did this not only on LinkedIn, but then you launched a podcast, right? And I always like coach people like you can like you don't have to launch a podcast, but like build some sort of content, even like you know on LinkedIn. Even if you sharing someone else's work and you putting like some of your thoughts on top of that, like, hey, this is really awesome. And like, this is how it's impacted me in my own life and like give additional value and give credit to whoever like created that piece of work. And then that, again, gives visibility to all your potential clients. It also gives legitimacy like you're a human. And then it also like shows that you're actually like a thought, like thoughtful, strategic person who's like trying to add value to the world of business. So that's the second piece that I thought was amazing. And then the other one, which is related to this, is the one to many, right? So the incredible thing about creating content is this one to many right? You create a piece of content, even if it's just like, you know, commenting on someone else's piece of work, all these other people see it, right? Or like people will forward it like, hey, check this out. And then when you have something like a podcast, (laughs) it's one to many. And, And so I think it's great to look at it like both at like, the relationships that you build, like tapping into people that have, you know, uh, like many potential clients for you and building great relationship with them so that they refer you business, but then also thinking of one to many with content building. So this is like, you know, and this is all areas of life, right? It's not just like B2B sales. It's like, if you want to scale any part of your life, like thinking through like building like content as a person that's empowering to other people, it's going to like create opportunities in your life. And then also having one to many relationships like we all have those friends who are like, you know, really well connected or really wealthy and like they can connect us to other people like when we're in need of something right Um, or looking for something and they can be such a valuable resource. So I just wanted to kind of like call those out and then those are great just. Just to reiterate, the pipeline for life, that's genius. I love that. That's such a good one. I always said, said like, you know, I'll say to clients, like, hey, if this doesn't, like, work out, like, I'm in this for the long run, like, the long game. So, you know, let's connect on LinkedIn. And, you know, if you ever need anything, you need a thought partner to think through, like, a business challenge, like, I'm here for you. Like, just reach out to me. So that's, this is good, good uh, wisdom to share, Josh. So thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so besides kind of those, is there any other like, I, I mean, you've talked to a lot of people, any other kind of like top, you know, sales, you know, fundamentals that you would share with someone who's kind of like looking to up up their game? I mean, the, the business acumen part of it, we talked about this a little bit, right? Like, learn how businesses work and learn how companies make money. Um, if you can how, speak, how would someone go around that? That that was actually one of my questions is like, how would someone actually you know, what are the resources or, or ways that they can actually learn about how business works? There's a few things, you know, you can always go and just subscribe to the wall street journal and just start, mm-hmm. you know, learning about what they talk about, how companies work, how, you know, shareholders think about stocks, how companies get evaluated, things like that. Um, go to the, some, mm-hmm. some of the companies that you consume products from like Apple or Microsoft, or, you know, some of the big companies that, you know, that are public, there's mm-hmm. always an investor page on their website. And that investor page always has these earnings reports or uh, shareholder calls or things like that. You can download the presentation. What's nice about the, pre- there's there's a thing called a 10K, but a 10K is a little techie nerdy, like into the weeds of the SEC filing and stuff like that. And, yeah. But they always have like their earnings call presentation that's going to be like at a conference or to a board or whatever. And it's typically pretty pictures with, you know, graphs and high level like bullets of how the business is operating. Mm-hmm. Start consuming those. Like you'll start to think about Apple in a different way. You'll be like, oh, okay. So they have this partnership with AT and T, and that generates money this way. But then it goes to the consumer, right? Like you just start to kind of connect dots of how Apple mm-hmm. thinks about their business and wh- how their revenues come in and how you know their expenses go out. You know, just just start to do some of that stuff. And then the last thing I would say, if you feel so inclined, start some sort of business. It does not have to be a big business. It could be an Amazon dropship business. It could be a content 
you know, subscription business. It can be any simple, you know, and it could be an Etsy store. I don't care. Whatever kind of business you start as small as it is, you're going to instantly understand business, have to understand business fundamentals. Yeah. What does it cost you to make things? What does it cost you to sell things? How much money can you make? How does your, where does your revenue come from? What are your channels? Like it just do it. It'll, it'll yeah. be amazing how quickly you change your brain. Yeah. Learn by doing is, is like one of my like fundamental tenets to growing in yeah. life is like, okay, like, I don't know how to do this. How am I going to like learn how to do it? Well, like, let me just do it. Just do and, it. Yeah. I'll make a ton of mistakes, but like mistakes, like that is literally the best way to learn is make yeah. mistakes and then you learn and then you get better. Did you, you ever know, read a book say, called the talent code? I think so. Do you remember what the, the cover page looks like? Uh, yeah, I think I have it here somewhere. No, that's culture code. I don't know. I have it here somewhere, but, um, yeah. So that what you just said is the core tenant of the talent code, right? Like talent is actually created. It's not just inherent. So yeah. there's this stuff in our body called myelin and myelin wraps around the nerve endings. And the more myelin you create, the more talented you become at that thing. And the mm -hmm. way myelin is formed is by what they call deep work. So mm -hmm. like trying and failing, trying and failing, trying and failing. Right. And then like starting to figure it out, it forms this sheath around nerve endings. It's called myelin. And the more, and unfortunately you get to a certain age where you don't really create it anymore. You're trying to keep it. And I've unfortunately passed that age, but <laughs> as children, myelin is a big thing, right? You see a kid uh, shooting a basketball and like missing, but then all of a sudden like elbow comes in and they get a little bit and then like that's that creation process of building a talent in something. So, Hey there, just a few words about the incredible show sponsors for today's episode, and then we'll dig right back in. This show is brought to you by Feel Free from Botanic Tonics. This product is unlike anything I've ever had before. No joke. It's made with kava root and other ancient plants, and just half a shot gives me this incredible sense of focused flow and productivity. And I love to take just half a shot right before I work out. I take it with my pre-workout and it takes my workouts to the next level. It is seriously unlike anything I've ever had. It's also an incredible productivity tool for any big work projects that you have or long periods of time where you just need to be super focused in flow state and get a lot of shit done. So if you want to give this a shot, you can go to botanictonics.com and use code DRAGON at checkout to get 40% off your first order. No joke, 40% off with code DRAGON. That's feel free from botanictonics.com, code DRAGON. Feel free, feel good. Yeah, I'm probably going to mess up how you say it. I just recently kind of learned this. Like there's like these kind of two distinct periods in uh, one's life. It's kind of like the innovation period where you're just able to like innovate and come up with all these incredible creative ideas and like grow like crazy and learn all these new things. And then you cross over into this kind of like this wisdom age where like you're able to then like turn around and like share like deep wisdom and insight with others and, and be more of a advisor, um, like sage instead of like an innovator. And, uh, you know, I feel like I'm crossing that, you know, I just turned 40 this year and I feel like I'm starting to cross over into the more like, okay, now I share wisdom it is and weird. I'm, you know, I may have to like let go of this idea of being like super innovative, you know, as as I continue to progress in age. Um, if I remember uh, where I heard that, I will put it in the show notes uh, for everybody. But it's really fascinating. And this is uh, actually I think it was from Chip Conley, who is like a, he has a lot of work about being a, a modern elder for others. And yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll link some resources uh, to that in the show notes. But that's why it's so important for businesses to have, like, even at the the executive level, a good mix of, like, younger people and older people. So you have both innovation and, like, sage wisdom, like, you know, business uh, strategy, you know. And this is why, like, you know, the truly great startups that have, like, the super young CEO founder, there's always, like, a few kind of, like, older, like, you know, 
mentors or someone on the team that like kind of like helps bring in the wisdom and the expertise of, you know, many years spent in business and the ones who like forgo and just, you know, try to be like super innovative without any wisdom, like crash and burn. Correct. Yep. You see it in yeah. sports too. You know, you'll get a young first time head coach uh -huh. and they'll bring in a, a consultant, you know, someone who's been around the business for a couple decades who, you know, is on the sidelines with a headset, just kind of offering, you know, a little bit of sage advice to balance out the innovation. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, there's a lot of, uh, translation between sports and, and business. My favorite, you know, like, I really like to think about like myself as a corporate athlete, like, do you know what I mean? Or like an entrepreneurial athlete. Yep. And so like, you know, when you think about athletes and how they train and their nutrition and like their sleep and their recovery and their workouts, it's like very methodical. And then you see these people who like, just like, they're all like, they're all go, go, go. And they like destroy their health and they like, you know, they don't focus on the other side of like recovery and rejuvenation and then they, they peter out. And also they tend to be, you know, unhappy with their life because they're only focusing on one aspect of their life. So I feel like that's a good segue into, you know, if you were to give insight or wisdom to your, your younger self kind of about building a career or, you know, going down the entrepreneurial path or even just like general life advice, what are some of the things that you would like tell your younger self or a younger version of you? Yeah. I mean, I would say, you know, we've talked about it a little bit, lean even harder into relationships. They're going to accelerate mm -hmm. a lot of things, whether it's finding a job, coming up with an idea, starting a business, getting better at sales, whatever it may be. Like really don't be afraid to lean into relationships. That's what they're there for. And Mm -hmm. nurture them even earlier, right? Like I was never that great. You know, I played a lot of high school and college sports and I wasn't the best at like staying in touch with my teammates and, and this and that. So like that would be something, even if they have no relation to your business or whatever, like those things matter. Um, having those people that you can lean on that, like you said earlier, know your life and are willing to kind of hop in and lend you an ear every now and then I think is really important. Um, so relationships yeah. lean in, lean in early and often. That would be one thing where I think I've, yeah. I've done it pretty well in my business life, but I don't think I've done it as well in my personal life. And I, it's, it's, uh, you know, it, it could, it could definitely be better. There's two schools of thought on, on, on career growth. You know, one is when you're young, you don't have as much responsibility, so it's, you can afford to fail. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. It's kind of the path I went, right? Just start a company, make a bunch of mistakes, Maybe you fail, maybe you're good, whatever, but the lessons that you learn are probably going to accelerate anything that you learned in college, right? Unless you're no super smart like you and you go to Stanford. But if you're just a regular uh, state school guy like me, you know, it's uh, it, that those early failures and just trying to innovate, like you said, I think is important. You know, the other school is, you know, go get some job and learn on the, you know, learn in a big company and, and do this and do that. I just... I don't think the growth happens there. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I think the growth, you don't, you don't really get as many chances to make mistakes. Like all the rules are already defined for you. Yeah. It's funny. I've got this weird dichotomy in my personality. Like I hate process and I hate rules, but I'm one of the most regimented people you'll ever meet. I it's understand super, you. I just have super to say weird. Cause I'm very similar. Like I rebel against like rules and processes, but I'm one of the most disciplined people I know in my own life. Right. So it's, it's, it's super weird. So that's, that's another thing to think about. Just like when you're young, don't be afraid to make mistakes, go out, try it, do it. Don't be afraid. If you hit a home run, awesome. Good for you. If you don't, which is more likely awesome. There's something yeah. you can take from that, that you can apply somewhere else. So, you know, when you're young, try it out. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. You can afford to fail a lot more than you can when you're 42 with three kids in a big house. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's actually a genius one because I I kind of went down this route like the wrong route first. So I tried I tried to get into investment banking. Like I did like two different invest uh, investment banking internships, and I was trying to go down like the big company like career path yeah. and like you know 
internally from like day one, I knew this wasn't for me and I hated it. And it's not what I wanted to do, but it's what I thought I should do as a successful Stanford student. Like I fell prey to that, like, this is like what a successful Stanford student does. And ultimately, I ended up, uh, you know, stopping out of Stanford or dropping out of Stanford. And then I went and like got into the Hollywood nightclub business. And that was like a insane, like, you know, roller coaster, as well as like incredible learning experience about like how businesses make money, especially a hospitality industry. And, you know, I think what you're pointing out is, is, so key for the younger people is like when you are younger like go work at that startup that might not make it go you know uh start that business that like you might like waste all your money like trying to build but like when you're like in your early 20s like it doesn't matter if you run out of money you can always go get the like safe job later like you have no responsibilities like in terms of like kids and a mortgage and all that and i think that's actually genius like uh uh, or like great wisdom is like go after the more riskier things when you're young because uh, totally. you're just going to like even if you totally fall flat on your fucking face like you're going to learn so much and it's yep. going to like hyper growth your own career in ways that you can't even imagine it's so funny i have this buddy uh, who's like stupid smart right like out of control smart and he you know full ride scholarship to the baritone Barrett honors college day issue you know the whole deal got hired by honeywell out of college, mm-hmm. you know, you know, so 23, I think 130 K salary, something like that, which, you know, that's, a, that's a lot of money you're 23 yep. year old. And he, his first job, he automated it in a week, <laughs> the entire job. And yeah. then sat back and started building online businesses. Uh-huh. Right. Like, like, you know, search engines, optimized web pages. The people found out and were like, Oh, well, we're going to give you a promotion. So they gave him more money, more responsibility. He op- he automated that job in three weeks and went back to building side businesses and this and that. And then they offered him another one. And he's like, nah, I, I don't want to do this. I can't. This job is not for me. And he went out and just took a risk and just started, you know, doing side hustles that turned into, you know, real income after several years. Right. And now yeah. later in his career, he's got this business that produces like legitimate income. It's a safety net because he spent all that time when he was younger and he had no kids and this and that. And now he's got some corporate job that pays him that as well on top of it. And he can just sit and chill like, dude, un- unbelievable learning experience. And he's got diversified income now. He can do whatever he wants. Yeah. So I think that's another huge one is there's actually nothing wrong with taking like the safe corporate job, but like do other like side hustles on the side. So if you like need to like start paying down your school loans or, you know, you need to uh, like have enough income to support yourself, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But then like, you know, on the side, like try to build your own businesses or, you know, if you're too scared to kind of like go join a startup, like, you know, do other things on the side and explore your passions or interests. Cause you know, I I like to like focus on the things that are really interesting to you. Cause I think there's a, maybe a bit of overselling on passion because like a lot (laughs) of times people don't know what their passion is, but it's like, Oh, follow your passion. It's like, well, I don't know what I'm passionate about. So I just always encourage people like follow what is really interesting to you. Do you know what I mean? And maybe it turns into a passion or maybe you're like, eh, I'm bored and you move on to the next interest. And then at least you're kind of like following the fun and following the excitement. But there's nothing wrong with getting, you know, that safe job. Just don't be afraid to like, you know, with that security, take big risks on the side. Right. Great so point. I think that's genius. I want to transition a little bit like uh, into, you know, because you're both a father, a husband, and, you know, you're fairly fit, uh, I would argue, uh, uh, for your for your age. You're definitely uh, a bit of a specimen. And I'm just curious, like, how do you do all that and be like successful at work? Because I think there's kind of a like, oh, when you're like married and you have kids and you're over 40, you can't be fit. And I like one of my things I like to do is like break that belief down into the fact that it's untrue. You and me both. Yeah. Well, OK, so there's there's a number of things there in that question. It's loaded. Um, you know, I think part of the fit out after 40 concept is just you got to have a healthy enough amount of ego to care. 
right? Yeah. Like <laughs> you and me obviously care. We don't, <laughs> this is going to sound terrible, but it's got to God's honest truth. I don't want to go to one of my kids pool parties and all the other parents around. I want to take my shirt off and for the other moms to be like, Oh, yeah. Megan's Megan's husband's looking pretty, <laughs> looking pretty fly. Like that's a win for me. Right. So yeah, <laughs> that's just pure ego working there. Um, yeah. So under, I think there's nothing wrong with, you know, being like, uh, open about like, like, yeah, I want to look good. Like what's exactly. wrong with that? Like, exactly. Like, right. Looking good feels good. Yeah. And it has all these in, you know, like second like or side benefits of like you're actually healthy. You know what I mean? Like when you take care of your fitness, you're taking care of your health. And, you know, health is like true wealth, right? Yeah. So like the healthier and more fit you are, the more energy you have to give to your kids, to give to your job, to give to your to your wife. And this is what I mean about being like an entrepreneurial athlete. You know what I mean? Is is you wanna like not just train your like business acumen, but you wanna train like mind, body and spirit. Yeah, so, so uh, I, I did two things. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a story that kind of propelled, and I think it all it fits into the balance and 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 how you kind of manage these things as you get older. But you know, in when my career took off, and you talk about the crossover between athletics and sales and business and things like that, is when I hit a confidence inflection point, and two things mm -hmm. happened where my confidence grew to an all time high. One was I joined Toastmasters. That was a really mm. good thing that I did in my early 30s just to, I was never afraid of speaking. I didn't join it for that. I actually just wanted to get really good at it. And mm -hmm. just the constant repetition. And again, this is going to be a common theme, like the consistency, the repetition. I didn't miss sessions. I went, I did the projects. I went through the manuals. Like I did all the work, right? And that consistency of being intentional about the words you use, confident, like, that was a huge confidence booster for me in my career. That's one. Mm -hmm. The second, so after we had our first kid, this would have been 2008, my wife's pregnant. She's crushing German chocolate cake every night. I'm walking across, I'm getting a 40 of, you know, the big heavy IPA beers. Like, you know, I'm, we're, we're just kind of in a gluttonous state and I, I'm a little, you know, I'm getting a little fat, right? So, I, you know, I got to my my all time high. I got about, you know, 235 pounds at, at one point. And how daughter, tall are you? I'm six three. Okay. So, I, my daughter's born. We're still not, you know, really recovering all that well. But she's born in the winter. Summer rolls around. We go to my parents' house, and we go to the pool. And my mom afterwards sends me emails me pictures from the pool day me and my daughter mm. and i looked at this picture and i go who is that fat fuck i was like this is unbelievable i was beside myself and yeah. that night i stayed up and i was watching tv and i saw an infomercial for p90x oh my god i yes. bought p90x i did the program twice right full through full 90 days twice I went from 235 to like 197, mm -hmm. got myself, you know, into that mindset. I did another beach body program, I think. And I got down even leaner. I got too lean. My yeah. wife didn't like that, but that set the table for consistency. And from that mm -hmm. year, that was 2009. I've never looked back. I don't miss workouts. Yeah. I get up at five in the morning. It's my time. So now you fast forward. I got three kids. I had one that 5. AM is no one else is awake. I'm in the yep. house by myself. I built a gym into my house. I walk in there. It's quiet. I drink a coffee. I work out and I enjoy yep. it. Right. Like that's what I do. And that is just like a mental sets me up for everything else. Did you know that 95% of podcasts fail? They don't get past episode five. Mm -hmm. People just stop doing it. Well, like I said, no one's going to be more consistent than me. I decided I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So I just keep making podcasts. Like that's, so if there is one superpower that you can control, no matter what it is you do in your life or your career, if you do it consistently, anything you decide to do, you're going to out achieve like 80% of everybody because most people can't apply consistency to anything in their life. Yeah. Hey there, just a few words about the incredible show sponsors for today's episode, and then we'll dig right back in. Today's show is brought to you by Fit Rich Vegan. If you're ready to get in the best shape of your life, 
double your income, and 10x your savings investments, then this is the coaching program for you. But wait a minute, Dragon. Isn't this your coaching program? Heck yeah, it is. I spent the last eight years mastering my fitness and my finances, and I've built an incredible coaching program with an incredible team to help you get the body of your dreams and finally achieve that level of financial success that you've been seeking. So if you want to find out if you're a good fit for the program, go to fitrichvegan.com and book your free consultation today. Or you can just DM me on Instagram with the words fitrichvegan, and we can chat about if it's going to be a good fit for you. I'm committed to empowering people to actually achieve their fitness and financial goals. I spent the last 20 years trying to figure this out on my own. And what I realized is the key to doing it is not doing it alone. You have to have coaches, you have to have mentors, and you have to be a part of masterminds. And that's exactly what Fitch Rich Vegan has. It has coaches, mentors, and it is a mastermind. So again, if you're ready to book your free consultation today, go to fitrichvegan.com or drop me a DM on Instagram. Yeah, there's a couple like nuggets that I really want to uh, like call out. So first and foremost, like you just like you decided to have a new mindset around your fitness. Like you started with your mindset and like that was catalyzed by, you know, you seeing yourself and like what you had become. Yeah. And then you decided to make it a lifestyle. So literally like, and this is one of the things. So, you know, I have a, a fitness and money coaching program is, and people ask me like, Justin, what's the key to like being fit? And I, I always say, it's like, make it your lifestyle. So if like you're, if you live a fit lifestyle, by default, you'll have a fit mindset Correct. and you'll live a fit life. And then obviously consistency is huge and, and discipline. Similar to you, like I get up crazy early, like, and, you know, I work out before I start my like work almost always. This has changed. Like I should say before I start my sales work, once I launched a podcast uh, and a coaching program, I actually for the first time in my life, I'm so excited about those two endeavors that I actually wake up and immediately work on them for 60 to 90 minutes. Then I go to the gym, get that done, and then I work on my sales job. But uh, I have to say, uh, Toastmasters is something that I've been telling myself I would do forever, and I haven't done it. But I have done other things that have forced me to become a much better speaker. Yeah. Uh, so huge note to all you uh, people: like, don't be afraid to join Toastmasters, no matter what you do, because obviously it's going to make you a better speaker. And business is done; life is done through communication. And then, secondly, P90X, you and I share that. I totally <laughs> did P90X That's like two or best, three man. times. Yeah. Then I did two or three of their other beach body programs. So totally. <laughs> Like, I would say, like, for anyone who, like, uh, it's still a great program. Like, it I is. would still go back to it. It's, like, it's got everything from, like, bodybuilding, like, strength training to, like, yoga and cardio. And it's, like, comprehensive. And it's it's really good. It's really um, well done. Tony I think Horton I actually has, ha he's, Yeah, he's, he's, he's done a good job. <laughs> yeah. So we'll leave that in the show notes for people. So, okay. And then how about, like, uh, being, like, a great you know, father and husband. Um, so you're taking care of yourself first, obviously, it sounds like you wake up and you take care of your fitness. And then that translates into your work. And then I assume it probably translates uh, into you being, you know, a better uh, father and husband than other people potentially who are so focused on work. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. Well, you talked about the crossover from innovation to wisdom, right? And you get a little bit older and, and you get a little bit of wisdom. And you know, when you're younger, you have the desire to hustle, right? And there's a bit of a hustle culture out there that's like, you know, just grind yourself to the bone. I've always really wanted to, you know, work smarter, not harder. Mm -hmm. And as you get older, you can really focus from a work standpoint on the things that actually matter. There's so much noise in your work life that you can get yourself dragged into that doesn't yeah. really matter. 
like you can ignore things. You'd be, you'd be amazed at how many things you can ignore that'll solve themselves <laughs> if you just do nothing. I'm laughing my head off because this is so true. If you just don't respond to the email for like 24 hours, it'll like work itself out. Right, it'll it's work like- itself out. <laughs> so that takes a little bit of like confidence, right? And, and time yeah. and learning, but really focus on the things that matter because those things that matter are going to produce the results that are going to catapult your career. Like that that's all that really matters. Yeah. Um, you know, I could not, my wife stopped working after our third because we could. And yeah. If I look at now, I don't know how we would do it. If she did work, it would be really, really hard. Um, so mm-hmm. I give her a lot of credit for sacrificing, you know, a career to put our kids first and, mm-hmm. you know, make sure that they go out of the programs, the baseball practices, the dance recitals, the this, the that, and, and all those practices happen. You know, my job is just to show up <laughs> yeah. in, in, to the things that matter. And Mm -hmm. I I think I do a good job of doing that. But at the end of the day with your kids, like they just want to see you and talk to you. And sometimes it can be frustrating when you're tired. And I I will be the first to admit that I don't always do the best job of like tuning everything out and saying, tell me, you know, you got me, give me all your attention. But if you do, Mm -hmm. you'll be amazed at the shit they tell you. Like they just will, they'll go off and they'll go on these tangents. Like some of the best, my son and I, uh, drove to he it was just him and my daughter my youngest daughter to one of my trips to California this summer my youngest daughter fell asleep and my son just talked my ear off for like two hours mm-hmm. you know it's great right you just you start to, to, to learn these things so from a parent standpoint I don't like to give people parenting advice because it's hard and there's no like you know the, the, when I left the hospital they didn't give me a playbook if they're giving those out now I guess I missed the boat but <laughs> you know Try try to, to to love them as much as you can and listen to them. Uh, they can be frustrating, but they can also be awesome. And you can see these little things that um, are very much a reflection of you. I cannot tell you how many times my daughter says something and I'm just like, oh, God, that's me. And that's not good. Like, so <laughs> recognize more than anything that they mimic your behaviors and how you act and how you respond to things because um you will see it and you will be horrified sometimes you're just like oh shit i did that like it happens yeah my uh younger brother he has kids and he he made this comment to me that i've never forgotten he said it like no matter how good of a parent you are your kids will hold something against you. So like, oh, just yeah. be prepared for that. Like, it doesn't matter how incredible you are. Like you're going to mess up somehow. Yeah. You know what I mean? So just be prepared for that and do the best that you can. I think that's really great advice. You know, uh, do you have a hard stop in eight minutes? I just want to double check. Uh, I don't think so. Let's just double check. We can I have cut another call at 1130. So I got a half hour. Okay, cool. You're okay going over just a little bit. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, okay. What is just to like segue, they'll probably put a ad in, uh, this section for me. Um, (laughs) what is your fit rich life? Like, how do you, you know, how, how would you define that? Like, what does it look like for you? Fit rich life. Well, what's interesting with me in, in fitness is I like to do different things, but I give them a legit shot. You know how like, people will try something for a month and then I'll go give up on it or whatever. Like P90X, I did it for like two years straight with, with maybe another beach body program or something. Yeah. When I tried CrossFit, like I did it for two, three years straight. Um, mm-hmm. I did a, uh, OPEX fitness, like a year, like, you know what I mean? Like I don't, I give everything a year until I get bored and then I move on to something else. Yeah. Um, so I think from a fitness standpoint, know that like you said it's a lifestyle but variety is good right Mm. if you don't have different things that you're trying and doing and incorporating like you said like if you don't if you're going to lift weights try yoga like you know mix it up like have a lot of different things going on because it makes it easier to be a lifestyle yeah um and then from the rich standpoint if you have money like money matters i don't care what anybody says it makes everything a hell of a lot easier. And if you care about fitness, the more money you have, the more you can spend on whatever fitness thing you think is fun and you care about. I built a whole freaking yeah. gym into my house, right? I've got yeah probably the 
you know, a nicer gym than half the LA fitness is out there. Not as big, but <laughs> like, you know, because I can. And I think that's where, again, going back to the idea of focus on the things that matter and the important things will pay for the things that you want to do. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's actually genius. You know, so I always like coach people around fitness, like follow the fun, right? Mm -hmm. Like what might be fun for you for like, you know, anywhere. Be and everyone's different. Some people like it's like one to two years or more that they mm -hmm. like love this certain type of fitness. Yep. And then there's other people. It's like maybe one or two months and then they sure. have to switch it up. Yeah. You know, like my wife, like she switches up her workouts all the time. Yeah. I will literally do like, you know, pure bodybuilding for like, you know, three to 12 months. And then I'll go to like pure like gymnastics rings uh, for <laughs> like, you know, 18 weeks or more. Yeah, um, yeah. So I'm much more like I like to like not switch it up every week. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, following the fun, which obviously you're following your interest when it comes to fitness. But for you, you like to really like give thing a real shot to see like how it pans out for you. You also are not afraid to invest uh, both like energetically and financially into your fitness. And I think uh, that's another one. You know, my other sales mentor, he's at Oracle, uh, uh, the other one besides Brandon. And he literally always says like to me, health is wealth. And so he like invests in like good organic food. And like and he he's also like he probably has completed it by now. But like he's building a gym within his house. He's younger than you and I. But like he's like got a lot more sales years than I do, at least. So I think that's like that's uh, I don't have a gym yet, but uh that is like one of the long-term goals but i do have massive amounts of equipment that I'm i can sure. like work out in my garage totally. or i can work out in my driveway or i've literally worked out in my bedroom with my equipment like i've done the um same. yeah because it's just like it's my lifestyle so it's like okay cool all the gyms are closed or like i don't have time to go to the gym uh but i have time to get in a quick workout before like my first business meeting like sweet i'm working out in my room or my garage or my driveway me and my um, buddy used to create stupid obstacle courses on Saturdays in my street and like sleds and tires. And we'd pull this Jeep up and down the street. My neighbors thought I was a freaking lunatic. Oh my God. It was great. Yeah. See, that's incredible. Like that to me is a super rich life. Like you'll never forget those memories. It's like it was, great. and I'm sure when you were doing it, it was so much fun for you. Oh, it was, it was like, blast. you know, it was hard as fuck, but it was just like, it was like that good hard. So yeah. that's awesome. So how do you now like proactively design and live your best life? Like what are the things like you're super disciplined, obviously, but like what are kind of like the fundamental things that you make sure that you're doing so you're kind of always living your best life? The, the It's knocking out the big things early. So I'm a morning mm. person. My energy gets uh, real low after like two, three o'clock. Uh, you and so, I are literally the same person. Yeah. So I want the important things to happen in the morning. So that is... I, I've got to get up. I've got to work out because, you know, my body feels better. My mind feels better. Um, I want to be able to, I try not to take early calls just so I can help get the kids out the door. But mm -hmm. if I have to, and they're important, I will. But again, they have to be important, right? It's not just some internal call about some BS, right? Like it's a, a legit prospect or customer or someone that like needs that time. Yeah. So there are exceptions. I don't, I'm not a black and white person. Like it doesn't, yeah. not everything's a hard and fast rule, but before noon, I want the the hard work of the day to be done mm -hmm. so that in the afternoon, it's funny. I actually have some creativity that pops up in the afternoon where mm -hmm. I'll play with things like, uh, maybe I need to build a deck for something or this or that. Like some of that work actually comes better to me when I'm just you know, it's not important, but like the, the communication, the talking to people like that all stuff has to happen in the morning. Yeah. No, that's, that's super fascinating uh, to me because I think, uh, you know, one of the things I always, you know, coach people on is like understanding your chronotype and your circadian rhythm. Cause like everyone's different. Like my wife is a night person and not a morning person. Yeah. And like, so she does her best work at night and she like, she'll like go out and like do the Peloton at like seven o'clock in our garage. Yeah. And I like, I like I'm doing the Peloton at like four or 5 a.m. Like, yeah, exactly. do, do you know what I mean? Like Same. I like I could I, like not even fathom doing a Peloton at seven o'clock. Not at this age. When I was younger, I could do workout anytime. Yeah. Then like, I think as you get older, you start to like 
almost like be forced to follow your natural circadian rhythm and so i always like coach people like figure out like we all know it. it's like when like do you naturally wake up early or do you naturally yeah. sleep in do you naturally go to bed uh early or do you naturally go to bed late so um i'm a huge proponent of kind of like knocking out those big things first um but i also say for the people who do your more like your best work in the second half of the day know that and do that so that's really good. Um, well, you just mentioned you... something else before you before you go on. Uh, sure, you know, sure. It comes to, to the whole holistic life concept. So you mentioned, you know, you're a morning person. Your wife's not. Like she's in the afternoon. Learning how to navigate your significant other is not easy. And I've been mm. married for 15 years. And I'm still not great at it, right? But like learning her communication style, how she wants to, how she wants you to receive information those things can really add up and you know i know and it's crazy to this day like there's only two things we ever fight about and it's usually mm -hmm. my fault and because i don't i'm not taking the cues yeah you know and i get lazy on planning something or like a, a certain communication style i have figure that shit out and like invest in it because it'll make your life so much better yeah yeah yeah, I mean, for me, me and my wife, before we got married, we did like two, two, almost two years of like relationship coaching um, yeah. and like really just like learned like from a professional how to navigate our own relationship because, yeah. you know, like why try to figure it out yourself? Like if there's people who like this is what they do for a job is they like literally help people like build a, you know, relationship like to the best that it can be. So that's that's really good to bring up. Uh, all right. So what are you most uh, excited about? Like any like uh, kind of like upcoming things like, you know, I guess like any endeavors or, you know, the solo episodes is like yeah. in addition, like what are you most excited about right now? Yeah, I've got a couple companies that I'm doing some side advising for that I am really excited about. One is a, is a CRM customer relationship management platform in the commercial real estate space. So a friend of mine bought the company trying to bring it to market. So he brought me on their advisory board and, you know, I do weekly sales strategy calls with their sales team. Uh, I build their go to market playbook, like just these side things to keep the creative juices flowing and take my expertise and apply it somewhere other than just my, you know, day to day has been really fun. Uh, one of my buddies started a cloud computing company, I've been helping him just through a lot, a lot of different ways. Um, some playbook stuff, referrals, getting him introduced to people, helping him write pitch decks. Like, dude, it's just been fun. And seeing what happens with those companies over the next, you know, two, three years is, has been really fun for me and just being a part of it. So I think, you know, part of what I'm going to continue to do is expand and, and work with more startups and, you know, apply some of the learnings. Everyone needs to understand how to grow. Um, scaling sales is, is important. And I think I, I, I care about that and I'm passionate about it and I'm, I'm pretty good at it. And I've learned from a lot of great people through the podcast. So scaling that up as a, like you said, side hustle uh, here in the near term and maybe seeing if that is uh, what my future might hold for me, that could be interesting too. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I'll definitely link to your podcast. Is that kind of the best place to find you online or are there like other ways people should connect with you if they're interested in connecting with you online? Yeah, the podcast is great. It's just love selling hate uh, from there. You can navigate my website, which has, you know, intro to me. You can contact me, things like that. I'm also pretty active on LinkedIn. So it's just Josh Wagner, AZ or just Josh Wagner. You'll find me. Those are probably the two easiest ways. Great. Any last words of wisdom or anything else you want to share with the audience before we shut this down? No, I think that's about it. Uh, build a pipeline for life. Love it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all your uh, wisdom and insight with us. You bet. Thanks for tuning in. And remember, literally everything can be used as an opportunity to learn to heal, to grow, and to transform. So whatever is going on in your life, choose to consciously and proactively harness that energy and use it to alchemize your life to the next level. If you enjoyed the show, please share it with a friend or on your favorite social media and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. 
As always, you can find me at Justin David Carl on Instagram and all the socials, as well as at alchemizelife.com on the web. Until the next time, sending you lots of energy and plenty of dragon magic. 